In an age that saw the beginnings of fast and relatively painless travel, seas crossed by steamships, continents by trains, the most exotic, colourful, intense and dramatic journeys were those embarked on in the romantic imagination. Powered by a violent dissatisfaction with contemporary life, a sense of pettiness and impermanence of the world around them, the romantics set out for undiscovered countries. Countries of gentle and nostalgic make-believe, of full-blooded terror, of the baleful and lurid landscape spun from the opium dream. All the travellers had one aim, to discover a land more intense and therefore more beautiful than their own. For some, this journey led to a kind of heaven, for others, to a kind of hell. In Goethe's Faust, the anti-hero of that name accepts his dubious guide into a new world in the true romantic spirit. Come then, even if it be my death. Goethe's anti-hero Faust embarks on his fateful journey. I have given myself to magic to see if the spirit may grant me to know through its force and its voice full many a secret. May spare the sour sweat that I used to pour out in talking of which I know nothing about. May grant me to learn what it is that girds the world together in its inmost being. That the seeing its whole germination, the seeing its workings, may end by traffic in words. Oh, couldst thou, light of the full moon, look now thy last upon my pain. Thou, for whom I have sat belated so many midnights here, and waited till over books and papers, Thou didst shine, sad friend, upon my brow. Oh, am I stuck in this jail, this goddamned dreary hole in the wall, where even the lovely light of heaven breaks wanly through the painted panes, cooped up among these heaps of books, gnawed by worms coated with dust, Retorts and canisters lie pell-mell, and pyramids of instruments, the junk of centuries, dense and mat your world, man. World. They call it that. No way. There is a world outside, and this one book of mystic art which Nostradamus wrote himself, is not this adequate guard and guide? By this you can tell the course of stars. By this, once nature gives the word, the soul begins to stir and dawn. A spirit by a spirit heard. Spirit, unveil thyself. My heart. Oh, my heart. How it tears. And how each and all my sense seem burrowing upwards towards new light, new breath. I feel my heart has surrendered. I have no more defenses. Come then. Even if it prove my death. The symbolic figure of Dr. Faust the magician in search of himself who sold his soul to the devil, haunted Goethe all his life. The story itself is not original. Goethe would have seen the basic story of Faust acted out in the puppet theatres that were a fashionable sideshow in Frankfurt, his native town. And Faust himself did once exist, towards the end of the 15th or at the beginning of the 16th centuries. But Goethe made Faust into a universal myth. Goethe begins to work on a drama hinged on the character of Faust. The first part is written when he is 21. The second part is written over a period of 50 years up to his death. In 1775, Goethe is 26 years old. He has settled in Weimar at the invitation of the Duke Charles August and thereafter only leaves the city for occasional journeys abroad. The first part of Faust appears in 1808 the year that Goethe meets Napoleon. Despite the ravages inflicted on Germany 
by the Napoleonic Wars, the French emperor is considered by Goethe and by many of the intellectuals of the time to be the most charismatic figure of the age. And for the author of Faust, the prodigious political genius of Napoleon connects with the superhuman powers of his hero. Goethe, the alchemist, sees Napoleon as the alchemist of history, imposing upon Europe his contradictory ideals of power and liberty. The story of Faust is also a love story, because it is due to Marguerite, one of the temptations offered by Mephistopheles, that Faust knows happiness, treachery, collapse, and finally, redemption. In this sequence of changing states of mind, the soul is the key to Goethe's creation. Faust embarks on a journey through the various possibilities of his own being, achieving at last, and after many trials, a state of grace. The Romantics turn the journey of the man or woman through life into the theme of the quest, a voyage of discovery. It is a journey that begins in childhood, and for the Romantics, the tales of childhood take on a new significance. The great German Romantic writer and thinker Novalis was inspired by the powerful traditional childhood tales of his own country. While he was still very young, Novalis liked to invent his own tales for his 11 brothers and sisters. Each tale would be set in a different imaginary epoch. In this timeless land of myths and fables, Novalis discovers that sense of the fantastic and the miraculous that Granville instills into his illustrations to the fables of La Fontaine. Novalis writes, A tale is really similar to a dream without rational coherence. It is an extravagant ensemble of marvelous things and events. In an authentic fairy tale, everything must be marvelous, mysterious, and irrational, and everything must seethe with life. All of nature should be mingled with the world of spirits, and the tale should be set in an age of universal anarchy, of irregularity, of liberty, of nature, in short, the pre-world age. In the future world, all is as it was in the world of bygone days, and yet all is different. The future world is rationalized chaos that is at the same time infinite chaos. All fairy tales are but dreams of this ideal country that is everywhere and nowhere. This ideal country, the glimpses we see of it in this world, urge us to set forth and seek it out. of Hardenberg, better known under the pseudonym of Novalis, can be considered as the first romantic poet. In 1799, he undertakes to write an apprenticeship novel in the style of Goethe's famous Wilhelm Meister, called Heinrich of Ofterdingen. Novalis dies before the book is finished. The theme is the theme of the romantic journey. The hero sets out for an unknown destination a destination that is not physical, but spiritual. A character outside of time and place 
Heinrich von Ofterdingen is guided only by his determination to discover the blue flower, symbol of perfection, essence of life. Heinrich was just 20 years old. He had never been outside the environs of his native town and only knew the world through the few books he had read. As the day dawned, he glimpsed unknown regions. And when from the hilltop, the scenery which he had left behind him was suddenly lit up by the rising sun, the young man, astonished, found old melodies he thought he had forgotten rising from his heart to calm his confused thoughts. threshold of this horizon which his eyes had so often tried to embrace from the top of the neighboring mountains and which he used to paint in his mind in the strangest colors. For Novalis, as for all the romantics, the voyager moves through a world real or imagined. But his journey is essentially a voyage towards his true self, towards self-knowledge. Outward signs of men and nature encountered on the way are doors opening onto the inner life. Painter Friedrich would say that he had seen God in the reeds. Everything in his paintings, as in the work of Novalis, leads us to a meditation on the ephemeral character of human life and the mystery of life eternal. The old certainties having been swept away, the romantics substitute for a religion of faith, a religion of doubt. It is no longer possible simply to believe a voyage of discovery must be undertaken. with a strange emotion. He seemed to be entering the vestibules of the interior palace of the earth. The sky and life itself had no place here. These vast, somber halls seemed to belong to a sinister underground kingdom. What, he asked himself? Is it possible that under our feet another world pants with monstrous life, that in the very bosom of the earth are hatched inconceivable seeds? born in the interior fire of its dark entrails and become gigantic creatures endowed with an extraordinary intelligence? These bones that I see, are they the traces of their progression towards the surface of the earth or are they the evidence of a flight down to the depth? I traveled through a land of men, a land of men and women too, had heard and saw such dreadful things as cold earth wanderers never knew. 
Blake. With Novalis, the natural world leads us into the supernatural, the imminent to the transcendent. Reality lies beyond appearances. Clairvoyance is the key to the kingdom of knowledge. One of the travelers says, I know a very singular song of which the origin is unknown. It was brought to us by a man passing through who coming from far away was a water diviner. This song of his had great success, with its strange accents that were almost as obscure and incomprehensible as the melody itself. With this, he drew us to him with a mysterious power, and it haunts us like a dream. I know of a castle where a tranquil king lives with his strange cortege. He never comes up to the battlements. The castle's secrets are well hidden. Invisible guards keep watch. The castle stands forever at the top of a deep chasm, unshakable, impervious to all invasion. The countless people mill around inside its padlocked gates. Each one acts the faithful valet and calls his master by sweet names. They derive all their happiness from him and do not feel themselves to be prisoners. To break the powerful spell that holds them, knowledge alone will succeed. Then will come the dawning of liberty. The more the tyrant exposes himself and goes out into society, the more his power is weakened. Free men will begin to rise up, and at last will break their chains. The sea will take over the empty castle, and carried along upon its soft green wings, we shall return to the bosom of our country. How is it then, asks Heinrich, that having heard many times of poets and minstrels, but never having seen them, and being incapable of forming the slightest opinion about their singular art, I am devoured by impatience for someone to explain it to me. It seems to me that if this came to pass, I would begin to understand those things within me that are at present but an obscure presentiment. The theme of the quest and the fascination for times long past resurfaces in the closing years of the Romantic Age. William Morris in England reanimates the Romantic synthesis of mysticism and practicality regression into an imaginary past with a keen zeal for reforming the future. His romance, The Wood Beyond the World, printed and illustrated by himself, sets Walter, the hero, off on a quest into a landscape of medieval tapestries. It begins, like so many romantic journeys, with the crossing of the sea. He knew no more till he was waked by great hubbub and clamor of the shipmen and the whipping of ropes and thunder of flapping sails and the tossing and weltering of the ship withal. So water went up on the quarter deck, and the sea was dark and tumbling mountain high, and the white horses were running down the valleys thereon, and the clouds drove low over all and bore a scud of rain along with them. And though there was but a rag of sail on her, the ship flew before the wind, rolling a great wash of water from bulwark to bulwark. Walter stood looking on it all a while, holding on by a stay rope, and saying to himself that it was well that they were driving so fast towards new things. A century apart, Morris's Walter echoes the cry of Goethe's Faust. Come then, even if it prove my death. In the art of the Romantics, the fantastic journey takes many forms. Heinrich Heine paints a startlingly grim picture of the imagination of the musician and storyteller Ernst Theodor Amadeus Hoffmann. Hoffmann saw only spectres everywhere. 
They made faces at him from the bottom of each Chinese teapot and from beneath every wig in Berlin. He was an enchanter who changed men into beasts. He knew how to evoke the dead and make them come up out of their graves. But life repulsed him like a sad apparition. He felt that he had become a ghost. The whole of nature seemed to him like a distorting and badly cut mirror in which he saw himself divided up into a thousand fragments through an obscure cloud like a face long dead. And his works were nothing else but a cry of anguish in 20 volumes. Although Hoffman started his career by writing pieces for the piano and musical criticism which championed Beethoven, he is known above all for his fantastic tales. In the tales, he mixes the strange and the imaginary with the precise and sardonic observations of humdrum reality. The journey could be painful, marked by great bitterness and anguish, and it could turn into a nightmare. The Italian 18th century artist Piranesi produced volumes of engravings based on the ruins of ancient Rome. They had a tremendous impact on the romantic imagination. They are eagerly collected throughout England and France, and his feverish views of classical ruins color the way romantics see and imagine. The Carcere d'Invenzione, or imaginary dungeons, is a series of etchings in which Piranesi gave free rein to his inventions. A typical romantic response to these extraordinary images is De Quincey's description in which he sees the Carcere as a nightmare perversion of the romantic's quest. A suite of impossible spaces full of features intended to lead somewhere, up, across, out, and which instead constantly refer back to each other in an endless series of irrational dead ends. For both De Quincey and for Coleridge, the Carcere by Piranesi recall, with hideous veracity, the echoing and sinister spaces of their opium dreams. Vast Gothic halls, on the floor of which stood mighty engines and machinery, wheels, cables, catapults, expressive of enormous power put forth or resistance overcome. Creeping along the sides of the walls, you perceived a staircase, and upon this, groping his way upwards, was Piranesi himself. Follow the stairs a little further, and you will perceive them reaching an abrupt termination without any balustrade and allowing no step onwards to him who should reach the extremity except into the depths below. Whatever is to become of poor Piranesi. But raise your eyes and behold a second flight of stairs on which again Piranesi is perceived this time standing on the very brink of the abyss. Once again, elevate your eyes, and a still more aerial flight of stairs is described. And there, again, is the delirious Piranesi. With the same power of endless growth and self-reproduction did my architecture proceed in dreams. The Romantics set out in search of paradise. En route, they invent their own kinds of paradise. A medieval paradise, a utopian paradise, an artificial paradise.
opium enlarges that which has no boundary, lengthens the unlimited, deepens time itself, delves into voluptuousness and fills the soul with black and gloomy pleasures far beyond its true capacity. To stimulate his imagination, Baudelaire takes wine, absinthe, opium, and hashish. On the wings of hallucination, he hopes to rise to those artificial paradises where the poet becomes God. Oh, just, subtle, and powerful opium, you build in the heart of darkness with the imaginary materials of the brain and with an art more cunning than that of Phidias and Praxiteles, a multitude of cities and temples which surpass Babylon in their splendor. On the 7th of August, 1868, the year that his book, The Artificial Paradise, is published, Baudelaire writes, I am weary, and have been for a long time now, of the necessity to live 24 hours in every day. When shall I begin to find pleasure in living? In the paintings and engravings of the Victorian painter John Martin, we see a dream world of tunnels, doorways, crypts, the haunting pinnacles, and the architectural megalomania that appears in the writings of De Quincey, Edgar Allan Poe, Coleridge, and Baudelaire. It is the world of the opium trance, and these are the fantastic and sinister cities inhabited by the opium eater. To escape their baleful influence is all but impossible. Like one that on a lonesome road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round walks on and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. When Shelley writes of a hue that when some great painter dips his pencil in the gloom of earthquake and eclipse, Baudelaire seizes on the lines and in artificial paradise calls them a faithful rendering of the color of an opium landscape. Here indeed are the dull sky and veiled horizon which overshadow the brain enslaved by opium. The artificial paradise holds out the promise of bliss, but the promise is hollow. Three years after the publication of Paradise, Baudelaire publishes a book of poems that instantly becomes notorious. The Fleur du Mal, The Flowers of Evil, gain him a condemnation for breach of public morals and a 300 franc fine. One of the greatest poets of his age is a ruined man, harassed by mobs of creditors. His health is broken by alcohol, drugs, and by the disease that kills him when he is just 46 years old. His private life is strung on a romantic duality between pure and impure. He loves his mulatto mistress, Jeanne Duval, and loves too, with a platonic love, the inaccessible Apollonie Sabatier. But goddess or whore, there is no woman who can journey with him to the country of perfect calm, perfect sensuality, perfect color, of which his poetry chants. For Baudelaire, particular scents become a vehicle for momentary transportation to this longed-for land. When, with both eyes shut on a close autumn evening, I breathe the perfume of your heated breasts, I see happy shores unfold themselves, dazzling in the flames of a monotonous sun, a lazy island where nature bestows peculiar trees and savory fruit. Men with bodies slim and virile, women with eyes of astonishing candor. Led by your odor to climates of charm, I see a harbor full of sails and masts, still tired by the waves of the sea. Whilst the perfume of green tamarind trees circles the air and fills my nostrils, meets in my soul with the song of seamen. Edgar Allan Poe, the American writer, was discovered for Europeans by Baudelaire. 
the first time I ever opened a book by him, I discovered with delight and terror not only subjects I had dreamt, but whole phrases which I had thought, written by him twenty years before. <laughs> A white flame envelops the edifice like a shroud. It is in the fire at the Richmond Theatre that young Edgar Allan Poe loses his second family, the troupe of players which he had adopted after the death of an alcoholic father and a consumptive mother. It is henceforth under the double sign of death and wondering that the life of the greatest American poet and storyteller is played out. In the crazy exaltation of my orgies, I trampled underfoot the usual limits of decency. He wrote in his autobiographical account, William Wilson. One year later in Boston, having broken with his adoptive father, he publishes his first poems. Then expelled from the military academy of West Point for lack of discipline, Edgar Poe goes to New York. His books are published without success and Poe, weakened by alcoholism, drugs, and illness, continues his wanderings from Baltimore to Richmond, from Philadelphia to Fordham. Poe's tales take us on a journey into the macabre and the supernatural, a world of terror, which was, for its author, real. the pendulum makes us gloat with the unseen torturer and suffer with the intended victim. for a kind of paradise. Through their search for more vivid, enticing and more democratic worlds, the Romantics criticized the society in which they lived. Rousseau's social contract and the French Revolution were two of the key influences that inspired various models of a better world. Philosophers speculated on the form it might take but the architect, Claude Nicolas Ledoux, set out to build it. His ideal factory, the Céline Lime Factory at Arc et Senon, was built between 1775 and 1779. be considered as the first sketch for the phalanstery or communal building of the philosopher 
Charles Fourier. The socialist theories of Fourier, who died in 1837, had a great influence on many of the romantics. He advocates a utopia in which all human passions would be allowable and legitimate. The practical application of the principle of individual liberty would usher in an era of human happiness. The actual layout of the working areas of Arc et Senor can be taken as blueprints for utopia. The studios, the housing, the vegetable garden. But that the preoccupations of Ledoux are still in essence monarchical, even theocratic, is made clear in his design for the director's house. It dominates the entire ensemble of buildings, positioned in the very center of the estate, just opposite the entrance. Ledoux himself, writing about his concept for the director's house, says that its lofty proportions should strike awe into all those who approach it. It is under the Second Empire that Fourier's theories on social organization were given concrete form. His ideas dictated the design of the philanstery that Jean-Baptiste Godin built at Guise. This factory of furnaces and stoves was called by its founder a phalanstery, or social palace. It is made up of three sets of buildings interconnected, with three interior courtyards covered by glass roofs. The phalanstery functions as a microcosmic town. city of workers, all is united, housing, work and school. But beside the working areas, there are also kitchens, shops, public halls, a medical service and a pharmacy. When it was built, there was a particular emphasis put upon hygiene as a symbol of social progress. In fact, the entire life of the phalanstery was run according to strict rules, which would today seem quaintly outmoded. In his book, The Phalanstery of Guise, or Wealth at the Service of the People, Godin wrote, This commune at Guise is the first example of capital resolutely put to use in the service of one vision, and dedicated to uniting all the things necessary to the life of a large number of working families. During the first half of this century, capital and industry have created work and have transformed methods of transport. They have established the factories and the railways. All that remains to be done is to undertake the architectural reform of housing. From the 1850s to the 1890s, William Morris, founder member of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, writer of medievalist romances, designer of heraldic tapestries, was actively undertaking the reform not just of architecture, but of all areas of design relating to everyday life. He designed, made and painted furniture, wrote and illustrated and printed books, hand-blocked wallpapers that are still used and loved in modern homes. In Morris, the two main strains of romanticism that a flight from contemporary life and the urge to radically improve that life are united. His own stories and poems are steeped in a poignant longing for a vanished world that probably never existed outside of the romantic imagination. And the theme of the quest, the seeker for a truth outside the common experience, is central to these stories. Morris, like his pre-Raphaelite colleagues, is drawn to the poetry of Tennyson particularly those areas of it that conjure up the evocative and mournful pictures of a chivalric and magical past. The Idols of the King, relating to the story of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, are favorite reading. In the closing stanzas of Tennyson's Idol, the dying Arthur is carried off 
in a black barge to an unknown country. At this last late outpost of romanticism, it is ironic to note that the poem is given a visual parallel, not through brush and paint, but through the brand new medium of the camera, made to yield up images that look in the hands of Julia Margaret Cameron as romantic as any pre-Raphaelite painting. And slowly, answered Arthur from the barge, the old order changeth, yielding place to new, and God fulfills himself in many ways, lest one good custom should corrupt the world. Comfort thyself, what comfort is in me? But now farewell, I am going a long way with these thou seest, if indeed I go, for all my mind is clouded with a doubt, to the island valley of Avilion, where falls not hail or rain or any snow, nor ever wind blows loudly, but it lies deep meadowed, happy, fair with orchard lawns and bowery hollows crowned with summer sea, where I will heal me of my grievous wound. So said he, and the barge, with oar and sail, moved from the brink like some full-breasted swan, that fluting a wild carol ere her death, ruffles her pure cold plume and takes the flood with swarthy webs. Pre-Raphaelite paintings recreate an image of England before the fall, as fresh and fair as Tennyson's Avilion. But Morris determines to connect vision and reality, sharing the romantic's conviction that their own age is inferior to ages past. As other ages are called the age of learning, of chivalry, of faith, and so forth, so ours, I think, may be called the age of makeshift. Shoddy is king. Morris set out to establish Tennyson's orchard lawns and bowery hollows in contemporary industrial England. It seems to be nobody's business to try to better things. It isn't mine, you see, in spite of all my grumbling. But look, suppose people lived in little communities among gardens and green fields, so that you could be in the country in five minutes' walk, and had few wants, almost no furniture, for instance, and no servants, and studied the difficult arts of enjoying life, and finding out what they really wanted. Then I think that one might hope civilization had really begun. Morris's designs brilliantly adapt traditional models to modern life. Houses inspired by Morris have none of the formalism of Ledoux, but achieve the understated but perfect relationship between house and setting that old buildings often have, and new ones rarely. In his hands, the romantic journey skirts the extremes of nostalgia and of anarchy, and arrives at a final but brief flowering. The romantic journey has left us an inheritance of belief in the value and necessity of exploring the most obscure and murky corners of our minds. It has left us with a readiness to set the material world against the reality of the world in our heads, the world of dreams and visions. Because of the romantic experience of this inner world, we accept that it is often dark, violent and bloody, as well as ecstatic. The romantic artists explored visionary worlds and in so doing offered us the key. We too can enter there. But drugs, dreams and visions are above all a way of regaining territory we have lost. The irrational, intense and true world of childhood. It is appropriate that the best loved, best known country opened up to us by the romantic search for an alternative world blends science art, childhood, in a way that Goethe and Blake would have approved. Described by a mathematician, beginning with a dream, experienced by a child, Alice is one of them.